Hey y'all and welcome to Stiver's Homestead. I'm Zach and today we are in the greenhouse. Now my greenhouse looks like junk right now. I've got a lot of work in here to do, starting with fixing that window that's been completely tore to pieces by the weather that we've had. But while I'm in here, it got me thinking about people starting seed starting. So we're in zone 6B um, and that is southeastern Kentucky. Don't hold your zone too hard there. It's more just about your first and last frost. Um, your zones are typically just helping you understand what seeds will grow the best in your areas because that's usually more of the tropical areas or the north areas and it kind of gives you a sense of what's going to grow better in your area but it's a very high level term um that is just really saying this is kind of the weather that they have anyways zone 6b is what we are here in kentucky take that for what it's worth um, and as we're all starting to think about what our gardens are going to look like and we're planning out our gardens saying this is what I'm going to put here or there or just kind of getting maybe a high level, you know, idea of what we want our gardens to look like. I always like to take that time to talk about herbs and the importance of growing herbs in your garden. And today we're specifically going to talk about ones that are going to help you with immune boosting and cold and flu, respiratory, all the gunk that we have. Because I don't know about you all. What are you doing, Rusty? What are you doing? That's, that's mulch. I wouldn't eat that. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but it seems like everybody's been sick like the whole winter. It's just everybody's had cold and flu issues. Everybody's had just all kinds of respiratory stuff going on. And, you know, it's because it's everything's wet. It's that time of season where we're all getting sick. But I can tell you right now, Jen and I catch this stuff too, and the kids. But one thing that's different that we've noticed over the several years of having herbs in our, in our system is we, have, we never get shut down. We never get to the point to where the symptoms are so bad that we can't function. We've always been able to function with just a little discomfort. So we are such huge believers in herbs. And so I'm going to go through about five or six herbs that you can be growing in your garden to be able to have immune support from here on out and cold and flu. So no matter what zone you are that is watching this, I'm going to give you different types of plants that you can grow in all the areas, from the cold areas to the more tropical areas. I've got something for you that will work in this. Now, in our store, we have all of these in tinctures. They're all in stock as we speak, but our number one job that we do on this channel is make sure that you have the information that you can take and do it all yourself and not need to purchase from us. So that's what we're going to do today. If you would like to give these a try, though, it's always at thestivershomestead.com. We have completely restocked everything from the holiday time because that was awesome um, but that is not the, the the purpose of this video let's dive into it so my more tropical friends this first one is for you and it is called hibiscus hibiscus flower is a I call it a tropical plant because we're in 6b some of our friends down south might say differently but the reason I call it a tropical plant is because it needs a long growing season so if you have an early frost or late frost to get your stuff out in the ground hibiscus might not be the top option for you because what we're using is we're using the hibiscus flowers so the the plant itself gets big it's bushy and it's beautiful but we're not we're waiting for it to flower and it always flowers right at the end of the season for us and that's the medicinal properties that we want to use. So those flowers are going to give you immune support, and they're also going to be great for cold and flu. It's just a very generic, it's going to cover all of those areas. You can make hibiscus tea, you can do tinctures, you can use it in many different forms that you want to to get the medicinal properties. But hibiscus, if you're in the south, it's beautiful to grow. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite. That one's going to be a top dog for you, and you can grow so many of them and take all kinds of benefits from that plant. The rest of them on this list can basically be they can be grown anywhere they can be grown in containers they can be grown in your house they can be grown outside no matter what climate you are so there's no excuse to not give these an opportunity to be in your garden first on that list is mullen mullen is nature's toilet paper so if you've never seen it it's a very soft green green leaf um, it's called nature's toilet paper because one it's not poisonous and it's not going to cause any contagion to your skin or body but it's also so soft like toilet paper would be so if you ever find yourself in a bind you're in the woods find you some mullen but that's not what we're talking about with the mullen today mullen is great for respiratory it is a huge medicinal herb for any kind of cough congestion just got it that all up in your chest all that cough that you have mullen's gonna be your winner got cats and dogs everywhere doing crazy stuff so mullen is very simple to grow it likes uh full or full sun with a little shade um it can handle most soils that, that that's around the one thing about mullen though every variety seems to be a little bit different some are annuals and you'll never see them again 
Some come back for a couple years or some skip a year. You know, you might have it this year, skip next year, come back the next year. Um, and then some are perennials that come back every single year. Um, it depends on the variety that you have. When it comes to the medicinal properties of that, it doesn't matter. They all have the same medicinal properties. It's just that some are going to be a little bit different on how they return. Now, what we have here in Kentucky, we have a lot of wild mullein that grows and it is the every other year kind of mullein. So last year, we didn't see much of it pop up. This year, we expect to see a lot of it. But because we like to have this consistently in there, we do grow it ourselves. Um, I would suggest building you a small container of some form or fashion, like maybe a small raised bed or a large container that can be moved. And you can pop that bad boy in there and just let it fly. For that, you are just gonna be using the leaf of the mullein leaf. You're not gonna be using the roots technically uh, in this situation to get the medicinal properties, but it's so easy and I promise you, anybody can have it. Again, mullein, respiratory, cough, congestion. Next on our list can also be grown in any zone. It's called Feverfew, and it's exactly what its name is. It's good for solving headaches, reducing headaches, and arthritis, and it also helps with easing the pains from childbirth, if you was curious in that. But the reason it made our list for the immune, cold, and flu support is for the headache specific. I don't know about you all, but when I'm cold, or if I have a cold, or if I've got the flu, it feels like I have so much pressure in my head, and I get like tension headaches all the time. It feels like headaches are just always going on in my head when I've got that on. So Feverfew is always on my uh, Feverfew tincture is always on my docket to be taking, and it's something that I take outside of cold and flu season. Arthritis is a big one that's getting set in as a as I get older, and I've always seemed to just kind of deal with headaches here and there. Different stuff like the sun, as y'all can see me squinting right now. Sometimes that affects my headaches, and so I always have fever few going on a basically a daily basis to help prevent that um, from happening. But fever few itself is part of the daisy family, so it's little bitty flowers. They look like daisies. They're beautiful. They're awesome. It's also a perennial, so you can cut that bad boy all the way down to the stem to the ground. Let it sit over uh, over winter and watch it come back every single year. Um, Feverfew is very easy to grow. It's not fussy. Um, I do not recommend growing it indoors. Um, it will get leggy pretty bad and you'll have long stems with a little bit of the flower and you're wanting that flower. You're wanting those daisy like look-alike flowers um, that you can then make as tea. I forgot to mention this. Mullen tea is actually probably the go-to that a lot of people do. We make mullen tincture, uh, but either one would work. The reason a lot of the uh, cold and flu uh, herbs that we're talking about are usually done as tea is because you're adding more stuff to that tea. So like if you're making a mullein tea, you're also adding a little bit of honey into it to help out, uh, maybe a little bit of bourbon to kind of get that like hot toddy feel that's going on. But then the warmth in general of drinking tea when you're sick is very pleasing. So you can be taking a tinctures, but then also hitting you up a cup of tea with that to just help all around. Back to fever feet. So Feverfew, we make a tincture out of it. Um, it's very easy to do. Tinctures in general are easy to do. They're all the same. It just depends on what part of the plants that you're wanting to use. Some are the roots, some are the flowers, some are both, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but for Feverfew, we want those flowers. We want them dried up. We want to have them soaked in vodka, and then we can have those tinctures ready in about six to eight weeks. Okay, next on our list is actually one that you can use the roots. Every ounce of this plant has medicinal properties that you can pull out of it, and that is echinacea. Echinacea is also a very, very pretty flower. If you don't have them in your garden just for that, you should, um, because they are absolutely beautiful to grow. Um, there's all kinds of different varieties that are out there. You want to make sure that you're finding ones that contain medicinal properties. There are a few that don't, but most likely if you're buying from any of our friends, Haas um, or any of the other seed companies, you're going to get the varieties that have the medicinal properties in them. So we use echinacea in a few ways. Um, primarily, just the tincture that is an echinacea, echinacea tincture. However, we've gone a step further with echinacea and we have a complete tincture that's called crud be gone. We have combined elderberry, which is next on our list, and echinacea into one tincture and call it crud be gone. The, it has a huge immune support medicinal properties that are inside of it. So keeping that in your body just on a daily basis, keeping a dropper full, helps you when those symptoms come to hit you. So those are the ones that are gonna help say, you know what, I'm not gonna be knocked down to the bed or to the couch. Those are the ones, if they're in your system, your immune system is getting stronger every single day. And so with Echinacea and Elderberry, they're gonna be your top two for that. For immune support, immune building. Echinacea also has properties for anti-inflammatory, um, which is gonna help in any case, all the things. We all need help with a little anti-inflammation. Um, that helps us stay away from more of the uh, 
over-the-counter pain medicines like Tylenols and uh, ibuprofen and different stuff like that. So instead of having to take your aspirin and Tylenol, your Dayquil and all that stuff, you could get you some Echinacea or Elderberry, which we'll talk about in a second. And then you can have your Molin and your Hibiscus and all the different ones up there. And that completely solves your cold and flu problems. But Echinacea, like I said, it's a flower. It's easy to grow. They love the sun. They love a nice soil that you have them in. Um, put them in a raised bed, make them pretty. Um, put them around your house um, for landscaping and then use them. Use every ounce of that plant for making your tinctures. And I've already spoiled the fun of the last one, but the last one is the top dog in most cases, the one that most everyone knows the name of, and that is elderberry. Elderberry just took the world by storm, and it actually, in my opinion, was the gateway drug for a lot of people into herbs and understanding and wanting more. Um, and a lot of people started by making elderberry syrup, which is a great way to use the elderberries. Um, we do elderberry tincture, um, but you can not, we have elderberry tea as well. Um, just having the actual elderberry mixed with some other properties really makes a nice tasting tea. Um, you can use it in so many different ways. Elderberry itself isn't an overly difficult plant to, to grow. It is more of a bush. It's gonna be a bush that you see, um, and the plant will come to the, these big heads. And then when they're blooming, you'll see them when you drive down the road. It looks like little white puffs just all across the road. And it's because that big circle head just has a lot of white flowers on it. After they've been pollinated, those flowers will drop and then there'll be little green balls on them. <laughs> Sounded funny then. Little big green beads that'll be on there. At green, that is not at the ripe stage. The biggest issue with elderberries is as they start ripening and they get that dark purple color, everybody wants them, including all the birds, all the squirrels, all of everything. So if you are trying to do these, I highly recommend covering them. That way you can get all the elderberries that you have or that are growing or grow enough to share with the animals because I promise you, it's kind of like wild blackberries, right? If you go out there and you're about a day late, they're all gone. So you just need to be able to protect them because it is a berry that every animal loves and they understand the importance of this bad boy too. But the one thing about elderberry that it cannot handle and it's what I see is the most mistake of growers is elderberries love wet. So if you can plant them by a creek that you may have or a low spot in your ground that always seems to stay wet, that's where you wanna plant those elderberries. They do not like dry soil. They do not like a drought, they will die. So you need to make sure wherever you're doing it, they're staying moist, they can have plenty of water. We usually plant ours around our creek banks and just have them there because we know that that soil is always gonna stay moist and they will always thrive. When it comes to sun, they like it, it's huge, but they are part of the forest area. So they're going to grow around trees, like wherever there's water, they're going to grow. So they're already used to a little shade cover by bigger trees that are around them. So don't worry so much about that. This is more of a forage plant, one that you would find in the wild, in the woods, in different areas. It's going to be crowded with a bunch of different things. So it's not worried about crowding space. So you don't have a whole lot of difficult growing it. Just make sure it's in a wet spot. But elderberry, immune support immune support immune support it is huge a lot of people take it for cold and flu but in my opinion it's more of an immune support herb and the reason it's so good during cold and flu season is because it's helping reduce our symptoms like we've been talking in this whole video but when it comes to like mullen that's specifically for respiratory where in my opinion elderberry is not specific for cold and flu it's specific for your overall immune support that's gonna help you fight any kind of germs or any kind of illness that's coming your way. Elderberry is a must grow. Let it go wild everywhere, plant a bunch of them and just have a lot of fun. So for today, that's all on the list. Um, I don't wanna overwhelm any beginners or anybody that's looking to get into herbs with too much information. Now I gave you a list of everything that we sell in our store with tinctures. You do not need to grow every single one of these to have cold and flu and immune support. Pick the ones that you think will work best in your garden. That's why I wanted to give you many options. Not all of them have to hit. Our top favorites are probably all of them, to be honest with you. But when it comes to growing and as the gardener, I do love elderberry because it's basically stress-free. You don't have to do anything as long as you put it in the right spot. That's gonna be your biggest kicker. Now we do sell the seeds if you're interested in our store, but other people also do sell cuttings that you would just get the cutting off of, reroute, and then you could plant wherever you wanted to. Do it however you want. We also really love Mullen around here. Mullen is one of our top dogs um, that we seem to take actually when we're sick. So it's when we have respiratory issues or we've got the cold and flu, 
we grab that one as our number one. Um, but all of them are great. All of them are good. Do your research on the different ones. See which ones that you think would grow best in your area. And the biggest thing is give it a try. Give it a shot. We do plan on doing more types of these videos in the different categories that we grow our herbs. This was the big one, immune code support. We have digestive combos. We have healthy heart combos. We have arthritis combos. We have a lot of stuff that's going to be coming up in the, in the future. So as you're planning that garden out, stay tuned to more of these videos and let us know if you like them because we love giving you the information of herbs and their purpose and how to grow them because to us it is the number one thing that should be hidden in your garden over top food. So y'all, we love you. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy. As a reminder, everything is back in stock in our store. Oh, I forgot to mention one. We have a new mushroom tincture in there. Yeah, sorry, real quick. I was like, I need to tell them about that because it's brand new. And when we have a brand new one, I like to explain it just so you know what you're looking at. A lot of our returning customers know a lot of our products already. But when there's a new one, I want to explain why it's there. For the last few months, we have been working on a reishi mushroom. That's how you pronounce it, that it's, it's that actual names like Gendonorma or something like that. I know I just butchered that, but it's called a Ray Shi mushroom. We now have a tincture for that. This bad boy is a super tincture. Like y'all remember when I talk about burdock? This one's right there with it. It covers everything. Absolutely everything. It's one of those top dogs that are out there. So if it's something that you're interested in, we do have that now in stock. You can do some uh, research on the reishi mushroom yourself if you would like um, before you're purchasing. But on the back of all of our tinctures, we explain what it's good for and how much to take. So if you're looking through the pictures, it's there. Also in the description below it, we explain everything about that tincture and what it's good for. So just look around, have some fun, enjoy the new tincture. It has hit my original rotation of everyday taking because it's just whoa this bad boy's got a lot of good stuff in there y'all i promise i'm done now if you're new around here hit that subscribe button we're so close to 100,000. thank you all for all of your support and we love you very much until the next one